Oh YouTube, what's really good? My name is Vivid and I am back with more WBE playoff coverage. This is going to be sort of a post round one playoff analysis and we have a lot to cover here. I just want to quickly say this so there's not confusion later on in the video. Duncan and Jack actually haven't played their match yet. I will cover it when they play. I think they're playing this Tuesday, but I'll cover it at the beginning of the next predictions video, which is just going to go up the Thursday before the next battles happen. I think we're pushing back the next week of playoffs because of the Crown Tundra. Either way, we have three dope matches to talk about this week in that being Aaron versus Sierra, A Drive versus versus and Wolf versus K. So let's just talk about these matches, what happened and sort of the themes and what we're seeing in round one of the playoffs here. A few quick things before we break everything down. The Halloween t-shirt design is still live on my Teespring. It's super adorable. My wife Emily designed it and I think she killed it. It will be available until Halloween. Please go grab it before it is gone. You don't want to miss out on this. It's adorable. It's going to be a one of a kind thing. Two, if you aren't already, please consider following me on Twitch. I stream every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I do Pokemon stuff over there. If you enjoy me here, you'll probably also enjoy me there. Those will be the first two links in the description down below. And three, a lot of my views are coming from people who aren't subscribed. If that's you, please subscribe. It would mean the absolute most to me. The support on the channel lately has been phenomenal and I'm loving every second of it. I'm super excited for what's next. Okay, that's it. Now let's just uh, talk about the matches and the themes of everything that happened. I shouldn't have to say this, but I'm going to say it anyways. This is your spoiler warning. I'm going to be talking about key moments and how these battles were won and lost. If you have not watched the round one playoff games yet, you need to do it. They're really dope. I will link all six of the battles that we have in the description down below and then when Duncan and Jack play, I'll try to add those to the description down below if I remember. Either way, there's going to be spoilers. If you haven't watched yet, please go do that. All right, so if you didn't see, I did a prediction video, and in that prediction video, I sort of talked about my thoughts on how these matchups would go, what I thought was going to happen, sort of like the things I was isolating. I want to point out I was right on a decent number of things, even if I wasn't exactly perfectly correct on my game predictions on the outcomes of things. Uh, but something I didn't do that I meant to do was include these polls that I put on Twitter that just had each of the coaches and I just asked my Twitter audience, hey, who do you think is going to win these games? Um, and each poll got around 285 to 300 votes. So I just want to touch on these really quickly. And this is just where we're going to immediately spoil, if you haven't seen it already, who won and lost the games. So the first one was Sierra versus Cybertron. Um, again, uh, around 300 people voted and y'all had Cybertron winning with 71.9%. Uh, that was like the 71.9% voted for Cybertron, 28.1% voting for Sierra. Uh, the Cybertron voters, you came out correct. Cybertron did in fact get a dub. And we're going to be talking about all these games and trying to break down exactly what happened, or I guess what I can, what I think happened. I also asked Audi, so big shout outs to Audi if you don't know who that is. He's in my front office. He's been a massive help in these videos. He sort of like wrote a little write up for each match. Uh, so big shout outs to him because his analysis are going to be super crucial uh, to not only my opinions, but to just how this video is going to be structured. The next battle was K Cray versus Wolf. Uh, Y'all had Wolf winning with 79.4%. So a little bit of a dip here. This one had 306 votes. Um, K having 20.6% of the vote and Wolf did in fact win. And I, I, this is just a theme of this. The theme of this week seems to be super impressive techs um, and 2-0 wins. Everyone that won this week was a 2-0 win. Anyways, uh, the next two, A Drive versus Versus. Y'all had A Drive winning with 72.5% uh, and Versus getting 27.5% of the vote. A Drive did win, had insane text that we're gonna talk about. And uh, yeah, it was a 2-0. And then Duncan Can't Die and Jack from Nerd Out Gaming. This game hasn't happened yet, but 81%, so the highest percentage actually, uh, voting for Duncan here and Jack pulling 18.8% percent of the votes um so yeah these games the theme here is kind of insane right like every single game that has happened so far has been or every yeah yeah because duncan and jack haven't played yet the other three games it was 2-0 victories in both like all three sets no game went to three like no set went to three games other than that every game it, it seems like every match had some absolutely insane tech and i think i would like to start by talking about dan's techs here um because i think that dan aka drive i think his techs are kind of like a master class this week in what draft league is so let's get into that let's break it down let's talk about some of the key moments what happened here and i mean i 
I even in my video, I had versus winning. I really thought that versus's control elements were going to come out on top here, uh, but they they did not. So let's let's analyze that. All right. So jumping right into the match between a drive and versus, I said this a minute ago, but honestly, I, I really think that Dan's prep here is sort of a masterclass in what you have to do in draft leagues when you have a suboptimal matchup. Dan even reached out to me and just because I wanted spoilers, he reached out to me and said like, oh, this is what I brought. This is how the match went before his video went live. So I knew that his prep was insane. And he said, I had a bad matchup. I had to dig deep. Dan brought an insane team this week. It was really well balanced, but he also brought really interesting techs. He brought sort of a standard weakness policy Turtonator, a bulky support Togekiss, those being the standard mons. And then he brought a Scarf Serena, which honestly puts in a lot of work against Versus' team. I mentioned in the predictions video about how many fake out users Versus has. Serena just shuts a lot of that down. Also, Grass type stab looks really, really solid against his team, with Inteleon being one of his main offensive pieces. And then the Scarf Serena also had Charm, so just shuts down a lot of Versus' physical attack which is insane. He brought Adrenaline Orb Blastoise, which is something I did not think we would be saying here. Like, Adrenaline Orb Blastoise is an insane bring. Versus has Incineroar, that procs Adrenaline Orb. When Dan messaged me this on Discord, I didn't even know what Adrenaline Orb did. I had forgotten because I haven't used it. I don't think ever. But when you get hit with Intimidate, it raises your speed by one stage. So now this Blastoise gets to be fast and max cannonade and kill things. It's a beautiful piece of prep. And then sort of a Trick Room Bronzong and the standard Sash, Blizzard, Veil, Ninetales that he's been bringing a lot. So some standard brings here, but the Serena and the Blastoise alone were just beautiful pieces of tech. And then the way Dan played the game was incredible. Versus actually brought a uh, Fake Out Snarl and Cinnaroar, Life Orb Offensive Durant, a bulky support Grim Snarl with dual screens and taunt, Scope Lens Offensive Inteleon, and Offensive Raichu with Fake Out. And I think the sort of like the biggest takeaways here, and again, massive shout outs to Adi for compiling all of this. I, I just can't say thank you to him enough. Um, the biggest takeaway here is that I think Versus needed to bring Gothitelle not only for the offensive pressure and trapping, but also being able to imprison Trick Room. Trick Room didn't play a semblance uh, of, it didn't matter in this game at all. It, like these matches did not come to Trick Room, um, but versus having like a weak Trick Room mode, it seems kind of weird that the goth didn't show up. That being said, Dan was just really able to sort of like capitalize on the fact that versus really has two main offensive threats. Those are Inteleon and Durant, and he was able to build around that. Other than that, this did look like a really solid matchup for Kingler. Like Kingler looked really strong in this match. That was something that Root noted in the prediction video. And Dan, just like this Scarf Serena covered that. You could either power whip or charm and it's nerfing this kingdra to where or, sorry this kingler to where it's it's no good i want to say this really quickly before i move on i really can't praise versus enough for the season i think out of all the coaches he has brought the most varied sets week to week i think he's been the most unpredictable and i think he has a really solid team i really thought he had the matchup here not aggressively but like a 55 45 is what i think i gave versus and i just want to say i also have to massively praise dan this build this prep everything about how he played from what he brought was immaculate let's look at some of the key points and the sort of like the key moments from the battle and assess them all right, so we're gonna be doing this for each match. We're gonna be taking a look at sort of like what I think are the key moments of each game. And with Dan and versus this battle, we have to start on turn one. This happens, just just wait for it. That's it, that's it right there. That, that, that's it. That's a beautiful turn one for Dan. He leads with Togekiss, so he has the redirection going. He leads with this Blastoise into an Incineroar lead. So now, Fake Out is basically null and void. Blastoise is now the fastest thing on the field. He can just max Cannonade, and even though Blastoise doesn't have the most stellar special attack in the world, it's max Hydro Cannon. It's 150 base power, I think, is basically what it comes out to. Not only is it going to be chunking whatever it hits, but it's going to do that residual damage at the end of the turn and Blastoise is fast and he can't just snarl turn one it just I don't know this is insane prep from Dan this is a key point in game one Dan really rides this offensive pressure that he puts on the field turn one to a win and then I like this is it this is to me this is the key turn of this game other stuff happened and like I said if you haven't watched these battles you really have to they're actually very exciting they're very good but this is this offensive momentum he like if we skip ahead just a little bit 
he maxes his Blastoise right here. See, he maxes his Blastoise. He cannonades into the Raichu. He kills it. That's all the offensive momentum he needs to really ride this to a victory. Let's look at game two, because again, just the key moments happen on turn one. All right, so game two, the leads are different. This time versus leads Raichu and Inteleon. I think he knows that he needs to lead a little bit more offensively oriented. He can't just play defense against Dan's team. And Dan leads Serena Blastoise here. And again, just the offensive momentum that Dan gets, like one, Serena is insane here, right? Because Raichu can no longer fake out. So you don't even need to leave the Togekiss. You do not have to worry about fake out. This Blastoise is still gonna hit things hard. And now the Serena just super checks the Inteleon. Let's, let's watch it, let's watch. This is it, this is the key moment. Scarf Serena with charm, by the way, which came into play. Yep, because you can fake out and he can't, right? Yep, oh my goodness, this, see, this is, uh, a master class from Dan. This is really a master class. It's, it's insane. Like understanding that you will one shot Max Inteleon with your Scarf Power Whip. So knowing that this is just basically the only risk in this play is you miss, right? The Blastoise fake out goes off. The right you can't fake out. Here comes the Power Whip. Insane. Insane, actually insane. Scarf Serena with Charm. I mean, Scarf Serena makes sense. Like it's it's one of those mid speed tier Pokemon. So like boosting its speed with a Scarf makes sense, but giving it Charm, giving a, a giving a Scarf Pokemon Charm and it actually being good and the Adrenaline or Blastoise. Yeah, this game, uh, this game, I think there was a lot more play to it. It was a little bit longer of a game. Actually, I think game one, no, no, no. I think this game is the one that was a little bit longer. Like there's more play to it, but in general, like Blastoise maxed, it was very good. Max Cannonade was insane. It also procced its Adrenaline Orb this game because the Incineroar was forced to switch in on it. And that's, you know, that's it, that's history. Adrenaline Orb Blastoise, I think is the standout here. That is the all-star of the game. I don't think that's disputable, but this Scarf Serena also put in a lot of work and honestly, again, thoroughly impressed. This is 100% how you have to prep against bad matchups. You really have to find these corner case scenarios and Dan, Dan did it. He he prepped really well. If he didn't do well this game too, he had a trick room mode he could fall on. Uh, I just think Dan brought a more well-rounded team and versus, and, and honestly, again, I cannot praise versus enough. I really think that this was just a case of Dan has more experience being able to build for draft league battles and he put his all into this match and you can tell. So that's that. And now let's let's go on to the next match. Okay, so the next match I want to talk about is Kay versus Wolfie. I was set that Kay was going to win. I still believe she has matchup, but Wolf's prep was honestly immaculate. Kay's prep was phenomenal. Don't get me wrong. She exploited Wolf's weaknesses in the best way she could. Like the Purloin set was brilliant. It had charm because Wolf relies heavily on physical attackers. It had Thunder Wave for good speed control. Like the Purloin set was great and the rest of Kay's team was really good. I think the biggest weakness was that her only real offensive threat was her Life Orb Ninetales. Other than that, a lot of her Pokemon were a little bit more passive and that was something that Wolf got to sort of exploit in the games. Uh, but yeah, let's just talk about the teams and then we will go to the match and look at key points. Okay, so for Kay's team, she brought the really dope support Purloin that I was talking about, the offensive Ninetales, a bulky Venusaur with Sludge Bomb as its only damaging attack and then like sub Leech Seed. She brought a really bulky Araquanid with Scald, Aqua Ring, and Iron Defense. So basically just sitting here checking physical attackers left and right. She brought a Choice Band, T-Tar, and a Weakness Policy, Dust Clops. Um, I think Kay mentioned this and it was sort of like her and her front office came to the conclusion that she would only ever bring the first four, or maybe not only ever, but those were the game plan. So the Purloin, the Ninetales, the Venusaur, and the Araquanid. Wolf's team was again like the prep here is immaculate he brought a flare boost flame orb drift blim just because he knew that he needed special offense to break through what k had access to so this drift blim set is really solid really good venus or counter and i don't know man like flame orb flare boost drift blim that is actually kind of insane. He brought Scarf Jolteon with Volt Switch, Weather Ball, Thunderbolt, and Rain Dance. So also really respecting Kay's weather mode, just because Scarf Jolteon outpaces Venusaur, so you can set the rain before Venusaur gets to attack and lower its speed. That's nuts. 
a Lumberry Dracovish that also carried Substitute, AV Scrafty, Goggles Arcanine, and Weakness Policy Rillaboom. Okay, so one, it's really clear here that Wolf paid a lot of respect for K's Sun Mode. The Jolteon was always a good Venusaur check, but other than that, Wolf's prep here is just really smart. The Drifblim and the Jolteon are really hot builds this week that I don't think a lot of people would expect. Like, if I was looking at the matchup, and again, I'm nowhere near as good as Wolf, I... I I really thought that K just had matchup here and Wolf found the way uh, to bring an insane set and just pull off a 2-0 win. But let's let's look at the game and look at some key moments here. We've talked about the team and the two things that I think were most important here, that being the Drift Blim and the Jolteon, but let's let's just see how this went. All right, so this is the moment I consider to be the turning point in game one to kind of set the stage here. They've both lost their Dynamax Pokemon. So Wolf Dynamax his Drift Blim this game and got paralyzed on turn one and then just died to two max darknesses from Ninetales. Max Ninetales is dead. This Scrafty is fresh on on the field so it has fake out pressure let's just watch the turn and see what happens Venusaur goes for protect a solid move in, in in a world where you're trying to play to protect your win condition and sort of stifle your opponent a solid move the problem here is that this Scrafty has fake out pressure so it gets to fake out the purloin always and then this Dracovish has substitute which is just super unfortunate. This is the moment where I, I think Kay lost this game. She gave away a little bit too much of, like, she gave away a little bit too much offensive momentum. Not that I think Protect on Venusaur was a bad play. I think it was a really solid defensive play here. Assuming that you could charm the Dracovish at sort of like prankster speed, I think it made a ton of sense. And I don't know, man. This was just really smart play by Wolf. If you watch his side of the battle, he even says K is very incentivized to play defensively on this turn. I think she will protect the Venusaur. And honestly, that's just, this is just a moment where like experience came into play. Like Wolf made a read. Not that he was ever punished for making this read. Like the Perloin was always neutralized this turn. Whatever the Venusaur did, it wasn't going to kill the Dracovish most likely. So yeah, I mean, just super good play by Wolf, but also just the substitute tech on Dracovish was something he was able to kind of like snowball to a win. This game was actually incredibly long. I think this is just the moment where it sort of started going downhill. Because after this turn, I'm pretty sure Dracovish and Scrafty just tag team the Venusaur and kill it. And then after that, it's kind of really Araquanid versus the world. And the Araquanid, while very bulky, just couldn't handle the entire team on its back. Let's go look at game two. All right, so this is game two. Now, remember how in game one, I said that Wolf actually got to hide the tech that his Drift Blim was Flame Orb Flare Boost? I think it played a massive role in this game, and we're gonna see why, um, but yeah. So turn one is where I think Wolf got a lot of initiative and got really, really ahead in the game, and let's just, let's watch the turn, okay? So turn one, K maxes, Wolf is also going to max. Uh, this max is going to be far more beneficial for Wolf. This is this is the turning point of the game right here. We just I don't, we probably I probably should have skipped the Dynamax animations, but this is the turning point. Instead of thunder waving the drift limb again, K decides to fake out the Scrafty, which makes sense. It, it makes sense in theory in a world where you think that drift limb is unburdened. The max darkness will not kill. Drift limb is a very bulky boy. And we have now entered a world where Drift Blim gets to proc its Flame Orb at the end of the turn, proccing its Flare Boost. Watch it. Just watch it. This is not good. This is not good for K. This is very not good for K. It's not a ton of damage. It's not a ton of damage on turn one. The problem herein lies that now Wolf can accumulate speed boosts. He gets faster. So he's getting faster. He doesn't need Unburden because he has max airstreams to get faster. There is a turn later that happens where he max airstreams again with Draco Vision played. Okay, so to look a little bit further into this, now Wolf has a Flame Orb boosted Drift Limb in play. It has plus one speed. He max guarded on a turn and switched into his Dracovish, predicting that the Dracovish wasn't gonna take a ton of damage from anything and the Ninetales would just attack into the Drift Limb. And then this turn is, it's just a big hit. It's a big hit. It's a Lumberry, it's a Lumberry fish. So it doesn't stay paralyzed. 
the max airstream goes into the nine tails does significantly more damage this time because it's flare flame orb boosted the speed raises the draco vicious speed raises the draco vish gets to pick off the nine tails for free in a world where Kay knew that this Drift Blim was Flame Orb, she just would have paralyzed it on turn one. And this, again, was just the momentum that Wolf needed to ride this game to a victory. We got to sort of a similar late game where we had Venusaur and then uh, Araquanid in play, kind of stalling out turns. Um, just, you know, they were both very bulky Pokemon. Uh, but yeah, Wolf was just able to out-offense them, and that was the two-game set. All right, so for the last match of the week, we're going to look at Sierra versus Cybertron. This was the game that I think I was the closest to predicting correctly. Sierra brought a Focus Sash Talonflame, a Life Orb Cinder Race, a Scarf Blastoise, Bulky Harvest Trevenant, which I think was a really smart call, Bulky Neutralizing Gas Weezing, and Eviolite Ferroseed. The Eviolite Ferroseed actually looks really, really good against Aaron's team if you look at it. Cybertron brought an offensive Life Orb Noivern, a Bulky Weakness Policy Primarina, an Akaberry. Excadrill, which I think was also a really smart call. Normal Gym, Explosion, Gigalith. I do not like that Gigalith gets Explosion. I have a salty taste in my mouth from it. Standard Sash, Whimsicott, and a Scarf Toxtricity. So just on paper, I think both of these teams were really well prepped for one another. Um, honestly, if you look at the games, I think that a lot of what happened just comes to like an experience gap, which I think is something that can be said for each of these matches. Like if there was one story to be told about the first round of playoffs, it's that legitimately every coach that played is incredibly talented and super earned their spots here but there's just experience gaps between these coaches a drive has more experience in draft league than versus that came into play wolf has far more experience than just wolf and cybertron have far more experience in vgc and also just in competitive pokemon than anyone in the league right like it came into play it, it really did but let's look at the games and sort of like look at some of the critical turns all right so we're here at the game and once again i think a lot of sort of like snowball plays happen on turn one that just make this game in aaron's favor and the biggest thing that aaron does that he reads very correctly is this this moment right here it seems so simple but these are their leads primarina neuvern for aaron blastoise wheezing for sierra he switches his Noivern out, which is, I don't think, a play I would make in this situation, but at the same time, I guess you kind of have to expect the Blastoise to go into the Noivern because it's not ever hitting the Primarina for super effective damage. He switches his Noivern into Excadrill here, isolating the fact that he needs the Noivern in the back because the Noivern has Flamethrower this week, which is also not something I would predict because Flamethrower is his only way to deal with Pharaoh Seed. Spoiler alerts, if Aaron didn't preserve his Noivern, he actually had a shot at losing this game because the situation we're in right now is Noivern is Leech Seeded. Primarina is Leech Seeded. If Noivern doesn't have Flamethrower, it can probably protect stall both of these Pokemon out of the game, but the Noivern was alive and also has Flamethrower and just picks up a very clean KO. Something I wanna talk about in this game specifically is that I don't think there was one very critical turn where one surprise tech uh, sort of won or lost the game. I think that they both had really good, well-prepared teams. I think the biggest issue here was that Sierra maxed her Blastoise on turn one, which I think she even talks about at the end of her video. She maxed her Blastoise on turn one, Aaron maxed his Primarina on turn one, Sierra's Blastoise never really picked up on offensive momentum. I think it KO'd an Excadrill, while Aaron got to take two KOs with Primarina. Like, he got to kill two things with Primarina. We get to an end game where Pharaoh Seed presumably walls all of Aaron's team if Noivern doesn't have Flamethrower, but he preserved the Noivern, meaning he got to win game one. And then game two, I think there's one very critical turn here. There was a bunch of small turns, but there's one very, very critical turn that we're going to look at. All right, so to sort of preface this game, it's been a slugfest up to this point. We are now at the last two Pokemon for each coach. Sierra has a Trevenant, which is like a bulky harvest set with Citrus Berry and a Cinderace in play. She's already revealed Sucker Punch. This Noivern is in play, this offensive Life Orb Noivern. So Sierra is going to Sucker Punch the Noivern here, and then the Whimsicott is kind of left open. I think she's doubling into the Noivern. I think she's wood hammering and Sucker Punching the Noivern, just in case the Sucker Punch doesn't connect. Now, the problem is, over the last few turns, Sierra actually hasn't harvested a Citrus Berry, which would instantly proc, because she's under 50% health. I think on this turn, let's just watch it. Right? Okay, so Sucker Punch kills the Noivern, easy, clean, 
moon blasts into the Trevenant, who is under, like, it's definitely under 50% health. Uh, the problem here is I think Sierra always had to protect the Trevenant. The Trevenant, if Trevenant and Cinderace are both alive at this stage in the game, I think it's close enough to a guaranteed win because then Aaron has to, what, what does he do? He prioritizes, I guess he prioritizes the Cinderace and kills it first because the Cinderace definitely kills Whimsicott, whereas maybe you're living a Woodhammer from Trevenant, but at the same time, you're just giving Sierra more turns to potentially harvest Citrus Berries. And I think if Sierra gets over 50% health, she's auto living this moon blast. So I don't know. I think this was a really, a really crucial turning point uh, that Aaron got to capitalize on. And then after this, there is sort of a turn where it's Cinderace versus Whimsicott and Cinderace should outspeed Whimsicott under normal circumstances. But Sierra has EV'd to creep Whimsicott from their last game. And this Whimsicott, I think it's either just max speed or it's sped crep to speed creep a Cinderace that's speed creeping Whimsicott. Either way, the Whimsicott outspeeds and kills the Cinderace. It's honestly like kind of heart wrenching. There was, you know, like Sierra maybe could have gone for Sucker Punch into the Whimsicott and crit, but either way, I think this was the turning point of the game. Like not protecting the Trevenant, I, I think is the only opening Aaron needed here. They both played really well this game, by the way. This was just like, I think the one turn that made the biggest impact on the game. Cause if both these Pokemon were alive at the end of the turn, I think, see, I think it's, it's gotta be close to like a 75% win for Sierra. I would be surprised if Woodhammer in grassy terrain didn't just kill the Whimsicott from, I think it was like sub 50%, right? I think it was like 40% HP. This is the last match we were gonna talk about this week. Let's, let's go to some closing remarks here. Okay, so once again, I just want to really congratulate all the coaches who made it to the playoffs. I think they all played out of their minds this season. I think they all deserve to be here. I think they've all proved that they are very talented and very skilled. Um, but yeah, just big congratulations. I do believe that this week is a very big example of just like, a gap in experience or like a difference in experience levels. Like again, all these coaches are playing phenomenally, but you have people like Wolf and Aaron who just have a ton of experience piloting VGC teams in a best of three VGC format. And then you have a drive who also has a reasonable amount of VGC experience, but also a ton of draft league experience. And I think that those are the things that just came into play this week. Also, I just want to mention that the next week of playoffs is going to be delayed by a week. So instead of going out this upcoming Sunday they're going to go out the Sunday after that that's to sort of allow for Crown Tundra hype and all of us to upload Crown Tundra content so the next predictions video won't be this upcoming Thursday but next upcoming Thursday and that'll be when I post the predictions videos I would like to ask you how you like the format of the predictions videos and these like post game analysis videos let me know what you think let me know what I can prove upon in the comment section down below it would mean the absolute most to me uh, but yeah what do you think what how do you feel about about the playoffs as they currently stand. Do you think that these matches are indicative of skill differences, like I said? Do you think, you know, just like whatever you say, make sure it is constructive and not derogatory because once again, I think all the coaches did phenomenal. I think they've all been playing really well. I think they're all really good at the game. Uh, so yeah, just what do you think? What do you think of the playoffs? What are you excited for? Who do you want to win? Like, what are your guesses? Just let me know in the comment section down below. That being said, I think I am kind of done here, but before I go, I would like to remind you to like this video if you enjoyed it. Interact with me down there in the comment section. Subscribe if you are new here. A lot of our views are coming from people who aren't subscribed to would mean the most to me if you click that sub button remember to follow me over on twitch that will be a link in the description down below and please don't forget the halloween t-shirts i think they're really adorable and they go away very soon uh but yeah that's it my name is vivid this has been the playoff round one uh post game analysis video and i hope you enjoyed it but i'm kind of down here and i have to leave okay bye oh you made it to the end of the video that's dope thank you so much for watching um if you would like to see more from me and make it to the end of those videos there will be a video here and a video here. This one is a video that I think is really good and this is what YouTube recommends so you should watch one of them. Okay thanks.